seven deadly sins. They exist in each of us. These are death-dealing sins. They will have a severely damaging effect on one's spiritual life. Lust, envy, gluttony, sloth, greed, anger, and pride. According to Christian theology, committing these deadly sins is as simple as thinking about them. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. Each of these sins has a secret history revealing how they came to be deadly. The seven deadly sins have had an enormous impact on history, society, and our souls. You cannot transgress God's moral law without someone paying a terrible price. And the sin that is most dangerous of them all is pride. The seven deadly sins are an important Christian concept, yet they do not actually appear in the Holy Bible. They first appear in the monasteries that dotted the deserts of Egypt more than three centuries after the death of Jesus. In about 375 AD, a monk named Evagrius Ponticus left the sinful city of Constantinople to join a monastery. There, he began to catalog the temptations that lured men to hell, creating a list of the most dangerous. Evagrius believed that there were eight terrible temptations of the soul, and pride was one of the deadliest. Evagrius warned that pride corrupted everything it touched. He called it a tumor of the soul, filled with pus. When it has ripened, it will rupture and create a disgusting mess. The seven deadly sins would fully evolve around 590 AD, when Pope Gregory the Great re-examined the list of Evagrius. He narrowed it to seven, changed their name from temptations to sins, and proclaimed that they were deadly. To Pope Gregory, pride was the worst of the seven deadly sins, the one which contained the seed of every evil. He wrote, pride is the beginning of all sin. But what is pride? And why was it considered so evil? Pride is defined as a form of arrogance, vanity, an overpowering sense of self-importance. According to theologians, pride made a person feel they didn't need God. The vices are working together under a chief vice, and the chief vice of all of them is pride. Christian tradition says pride even predated the Garden of Eden and the conception of man. It stained the very fabric of creation, reaching back to the beginning of time, to the birth of the devil himself. It begins with the ancient tale of one of God's favorite creations, the angel Lucifer. Lucifer was an angel, and he wondered why he wasn't, in fact, the most favored of all God's creations. Lucifer wanted to be as powerful as God himself. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam recount different but similar legends of Lucifer's cataclysmic fall from God's grace. In Islamic scripture, Shaitan, or Satan, felt too proud to obey God's order to bow before his finest creation, Adam. He says, I'm better than Adam. I'm created from fire and God's spirit, whereas Adam is created from dirt. 
And it was this pride, this desire to elevate himself to the level of God that resulted in his downfall. Driven by pride, the defiant Satan leads an insurgence against God. Armies of angels do battle in a dreadful heavenly war. Until at last, Satan and his minions are defeated and cast into the pit of hell. In defeat, God's most beloved creature, Lucifer, falls from heaven and becomes the embodiment of evil, Satan. This is one of the most powerful of history's religious stories, except it's not in the Bible. The fall of Satan comes from ancient legends gathered sometime between the creation of the Old and New Testaments. Even though it's not in the Bible, the story is a powerful parable about the destruction caused by pride. Angels do not fall through lust or avarice or sadness. Angels fall through pride. That's the thing that can separate most efficiently the most holy from God. In this regard, we share a similar condition with the fallen angel because also the fallen angel is exiled from God. Satan's rebellion continued as he vowed to poison God's greatest creation, man. Satan left his hellish throne to entice Earth's new inhabitants, Adam and Eve. The same pride that caused Satan's ruin would now benefit him in his dark quest. There, in the Garden of Eden, his temptation brings about the fall of man through the original sin of pride. In the Christian tradition, Adam and Eve's sin is pride. They do not respect God's order and God's advice and are misled by the serpent, by the devil. Disguised as a serpent, the devil encourages Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge. Despite God's grave warnings, Adam and Eve indulge in their wrongdoing. Instead of achieving divine wisdom, the fruit brings forth a bitter world filled with shame and sorrow, their naked innocence exposed, and their paradise destroyed. Satan didn't bring sin into the world. He brought the temptation, and it spread. It couldn't be contained. It's the ultimate cancer. It metastasizes into all areas of life. Satan's work continues long after his war in heaven and expulsion from Eden. He tries to manipulate man to his will. The Bible suggests God created human beings with free will. Religious thinkers say that it is humanity's power of free will that can lead to good or to evil. The struggle to be good in this world is just that, a struggle. And it doesn't go away. And it doesn't change because you suddenly cast Satan out or turn someone from darkness to light. The interaction between humans and Satan, whether real or allegorical, is one of resisting temptation. Throughout history, even the most pious of men can be lured into sin. When the Christian monk Evagrius Ponticus first created his list, there were eight evil thoughts and the foundation was the sin of pride. Pride initially was so big and so important that it got double billing, if you will, as two sins. 
Evagrius broke it into two separate vices, vainglory and pride. The two most dangerous ones are actually the vices of vainglory and pride. Vainglory is the sin of excessive vanity. In vainglory, what a person is doing is using other people as a way of puffing up one's own ego. I need you only because you tell me what a wonderful person I am. Evagrius believed vainglory interfered with holiness, writing, the prayer of one who loves popularity will not rise up to God. Where the sin of vainglory is concerned with others' opinions, the sin of pride focuses only on oneself. Pride is the sin of self-sufficiency, where there is no need for God. Anything that calls into question the place of God and assumes that somehow we have a higher kind of place than we are entitled to would be pride. In 590 AD, Pope Gregory took a different approach to Evagrius's eight temptations. He believed that the number seven held a divine significance. Seven had traditionally been regarded as a holy or powerful number. In antiquity, it was felt that there was probably this divine ordering of seven things that corresponded in some way to the heavenly ordering of what were thought to be the seven great planets. Pope Gregory combined the two vices into a single deadly sin, pride. Pride was considered a terrible sin in other cultures besides the Judeo-Christian tradition. Across the Mediterranean, the great cities of Athens and Rome also condemned pride. In the Greco-Roman world, it could be said that perhaps pride is the essential sin. The ancient Greeks referred to this essential sin as hubris. The Strait of Gibraltar, the rocks that are there, they were called the Ubri by the early Greeks. And if you sailed out past them, that was considered hubris, because the gods would get you. You weren't supposed to go out there. That's what hubris comes from. Hubris is the sense of saying, I am God to my life. The Greeks used cautionary tales of pride to warn people of the dangers of the sin explaining how it could lead to one's demise. There's Icarus, who thought he could fly on wings of wax. And Arachne, a skilled weaver, was transformed into a spider after daring to challenge a goddess to a weaving contest. The Greco-Roman world insisted that the sin of pride made a person challenge the gods, and the punishment was always dire. The Christian world created its own punishment for pride. It was called hell. The seven deadly sins have been considered a moral guide for Christians for centuries. Since ancient times, the sin of pride was called a crusher of souls, destroyer of man an insult to God, and a blight upon society. The evolution of the sin of pride echoed that of Satan. He and his demon army were thought to be fallen angels. By 1300, as the Renaissance began, Fallen angels were believed to inhabit the air between heaven and earth. And they had the power to materialize and deceive. If a person were not vigilant, he could be a pawn of the fallen angels and tricked into sin. Fallen angels could create a body which was only a visual illusion. 
in paintings, medieval paintings, Renaissance paintings, we always have an element in the devil's body that betrays nature. The horns on his head or his feet are goose-like to emphasize his being a creature that is against nature. It was said that fallen angels were especially fond of using the sin of pride as temptation, blinding sinners so they could see no one but themselves. Around 1320, the notion of hell was given a human face by the Italian author Dante Alighieri. In Dante's The Divine Comedy, Roman poet Virgil escorts Dante through three kingdoms, hell, purgatory, and heaven. Virgil is thought to represent human reason and Dante to symbolize mankind. It is in purgatory where Dante illustrates the most vivid accounts of punishment for sinners. Dante sort of fleshes it out and tries to create purgatory as a place, and that really remains in the popular imagination. The prideful sinners march around Mount Purgatory, stooped over under a crushing load of rock. For having spent a lifetime looking down on others, they are unable to look up until they've appreciated the burden of their sin. Dante's vision of the sin of pride came straight from the doctrine taught by the church. Traditionally, Catholics are told not to be prideful and traditionally even not to achieve too much, to be modest. But by the 16th century, much of the Catholic Church itself had fallen into the sin of pride. In 1500, Pope Leo X was one of the wealthiest men in Europe. He led aggressive fundraising efforts to support the Vatican and his lifestyle. In 1512, a German monk named Martin Luther rebelled against Pope Leo's proud and sinful system. He wrote incisive critiques of the Pope and the Vatican eventually breaking away altogether from the Roman Catholic Church. The resulting Protestant Reformation changed Christianity forever. Protestant comes from protest, and that's anything that is not Roman Catholic. The Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Baptists, the Anglican or Episcopalian, that's all considered Protestant. But among the new Protestant sects that came out of the Reformation, one group emerged with a single-minded devotion to fighting the sin of pride. They were called the Anabaptists. The Anabaptist groups developed in a variety of places in Europe. The very first group was the Swiss Brethren, 1525, some years later, the Mennonites developed in the Netherlands regions. Some of the groups still exist to this day. The Mennonites, the Hutterites, and the Amish, essentially unchanged from the 16th century. The Mennonites began a new tradition of placing pride as their most dangerous sin. And humility was valued more than any other character trait. The Amish took this philosophy even further by fostering an entire culture devoted to censoring pride in all its forms. The Amish do look at pride as a very, very deadly sin. And that's one of the, the reasons they try so hard to look plain. The Amish culture was born in 1693 when the Mennonites embraced a man named Jacob Amon. Jacob Amon was 30 years old when he became part of the leadership within the Mennonite church. Amon was a powerful and charismatic preacher who insisted that sinners must be shunned by the entire religious community. 
Jacob Amon really stood his ground over issues such as excommunication and shunning. That was probably the biggest issue of the day. And he said, when somebody's excommunicated, we will not eat with them. If the person is married, there will not be any sexual relationship between husband and wife. If that person is excommunicated, you cut them off and you have nothing to do with them until they repent and they come back and they want to rejoin. Jacob Allman set the stage 300 years ago for what we now see throughout America as the Amish culture. Today, the Amish set themselves apart from mainstream culture. Outside of church, they fight the sin of pride through simple clothes, hard work, and a rejection of what they consider worldliness. The culture ends education at age 14. By then, the Amish feel a student knows all he needs to contribute to the community. They use few labor-saving machines because they believe technology can only lead to wanting more, more room, more equipment, more trouble, and ultimately leading to more pride. Keep it small, simple, so that you can farm it with horses and not let it get out of control. Their disdain of pride can be seen in every part of their lives. They resist being photographed. Vanity, after all, is a form of pride. Even their children's dolls have no faces. Small instances of the sin of pride, such as boasting or rudeness, require a member to apologize before the congregation. But blatant pride, like defying authority, can warrant severe punishment, just like it did in Jacob Ahmed's day. A prideful act would be taking steps to change something that you know is against the church rules. It would be, for example, a man saying, I'm not going to milk by hand anymore. I'm getting a milking machine, regardless of what the church says. For a sin like this, the punishment could be excommunication, essentially turning the member over to Satan and then shunning him. Despite their best efforts, the Amish aren't immune to pride. Pride within the Amish culture is very similar to pride outside of the culture. You don't have the car to be prideful over, but you have the buggy. And you can soup your buggy up just like you can soup your car up. What's very interesting is the challenge that humility sets for us. In brief, this would appear to be a race to the bottom, because if you hold humility out as a goal, then people could conceivably start competing to become more humble than one another. And so in working so hard to be not prideful, humility almost becomes pride. Pride is a deadly sin that most religions try to shake, but none have succeeded but many individuals have succumbed to temptation and embraced it. The seven deadly sins are a centuries-old tradition outlining the evil that tempts humanity's soul. And pride has always been considered the chief sin. For better or worse, pride fuels the engine of history. It inspires and it corrodes, often at the same time. One example, the emperor who crowned himself because he felt no one else was worthy. In 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte was a gifted general whose staggering success stoked his insatiable pride beyond all control. When France became too small to contain his ambition, he sought to conquer Europe, brilliantly putting most of the continent under his control. 
and his relatives on Europe's thrones. Believing himself invincible, the emperor led a half million troops into an ill-advised invasion of Russia. But when he spread himself too thin, his enemies pounced. Napoleon was forced to abdicate and was exiled to the island of Elba in 1814. He escaped, rebuilt his army, but was ultimately crushed at Waterloo in 1815. He died in exile on the island of St. Helena. The expression Waterloo became known forever as the ultimate sign of defeat and of the sin of pride unchecked. Around 1850, the sin of pride evolved, becoming a virtue, not a vice. A new generation of fearless leaders emerged as the Industrial Revolution hit America and society shifted from agriculture to industry. Cities burgeoned with hundreds of steel factories, shipping yards and railroads, this era of opportunity also turned modest men into moguls. We can think of Andrew Mellon, Andrew Carnegie, Cornelius Vanderbilt. These robber barons were, in some regard, brilliant businessmen who took advantage of this new shift and made a tremendous amount of money in the process. These were men who became very, very wealthy, fabulously wealthy, uh, sometimes quite quickly. One of the most famous robber barons, William Randolph Hearst, made millions through his publishing empire. Hearst indulged in the sin of pride when he built the 90,000 square foot Hearst Castle on his 40,000 acre California estate. In the course of a very opulent life, he owned properties around the world, a man who essentially had it all. These opulent lifestyles didn't come without criticism, forcing Hearst and his kind to find a way to justify their sins. Many set up charitable foundations, transforming themselves from robber barons into philanthropists. Say, for example, the Ford Foundation. In order to continue enjoying such material wealth and broad public approval, you need to do something to help society. You need to show that you do not consider yourself a superior person. You're only better at doing business. And so the best way to accomplish this is to uh, create a large charity and to pour millions and millions of dollars in it. And here we find the sin of pride's paradox. If we perform a good deed to protect our reputation, is that not committing a sin? So if I donate a big sum of money in order to be seen and noticed, that is an expression of pride. And your father who is in heaven, as Jesus says, does not need to give you any other recompensation because you already got what you wanted. Public view, public recognition, no more than that. The sin of pride can be elusive. Something that looks like charity can really be the arrogant vice at work. Just as the devil can change his shape, pride can masquerade as something benign. While feeling pride in ourselves is easily defined as a sin, there is another type of pride which is often mistaken for a positive force. Ancestry, education, religion, our neighborhood, our nation. We take pride in all these things. Pride almost invariably involves a comparison between yourself and another person or yourself and another group of people. Some can even say that patriotism and ethnic pride are evil. The same selfishness that taints an individual can get magnified by a group. 
When nations begin to believe they deserve more, it can lead to a kind of hell on earth. And one person's pride can be the trigger. It was Hitler's pride that catapulted him from a lackluster childhood in Austria to almost international power. Hitler's commanding authority attracted a strong circle of devoted admirers who shared his vision. The Nazis gained control of Germany, and then all of Western Europe. Hitler elevated himself above all other people. Hitler tries to exterminate what he takes to be one principal threat to the Aryan race, and that is Jews. Success to Hitler meant horrific demise to others. We see that in the course of a terribly costly struggle throughout Western and Eastern Europe, that Hitler's pride brings down not only himself, but also this dream of Aryan superiority. Hitler's gone, but his Aryan philosophy lives on as a violent lesson in unbridled pride. The sin of pride is as entrancing as it is insidious. Those who fall under its spell, no matter in what fashion, face eternal damnation. Pope Gregory the Great was the first to label lust, envy, gluttony, sloth, greed, anger, and pride as the seven deadly sins. And according to him, the most dangerous sin was pride. Pride can appear beautiful, even though it's ugly as sin. Greek mythology tells the legend of Narcissus. He was so proud of his looks that he found himself gazing at his own reflection for hours. Enamored of his own beauty, he attempted to embrace his reflection. He fell into a reflecting pond and drowned. A victim of his own self-absorption and pride. The story is the origin of the term narcissist, someone who is so proud of himself, his looks, and his accomplishments that he can see nothing else. Narcissism is the very picture of self-absorption. The narcissist steamrolls over anything that stands in the way of his perfect self-image. A narcissist often shows a friendly public face that helps draw people in. If he sees himself as a born leader, then he'll need others to follow him. When they first meet people, they're very well liked. And in certain situations, a lot of people often kind of are okay with the fact that, you know, yeah, he's, he's really arrogant, but he's, he's great. He's smart, he's charming, he's funny. We like narcissists who are, who are like this. The narcissist loves being paid attention to but only looks out for himself. And if he's challenged, beware. A narcissist is trying to compensate for some deep insecurity, and so when they display their prideful behavior, you see some defensiveness, you see some aggressiveness, and so you see the more nasty side of prideful behavior. The sin of pride can also be exhibited through vanity. And this changes from culture to culture, and even from era to era. In much of Europe, certainly in England in the 19th century, the fatter you were, the more honor you were due. If you and your family were all very heavy, this was a sign that you were a good provider. Throughout history, the golden suntan was nothing to be proud of. It was a badge of shame, the mark of a common laborer. Today, of course, that has changed, and many, many people will go to a tanning booth. 
if they live in a cold climate. The suntan now signifies that you have enough leisure time that you can lie outdoors in the sun or perhaps go to the beach. But by the middle of the 20th century, pride itself became something to be proud of. One of the good things about America is that we are not only permitted to, but we're encouraged to rise above our class, to catapult ourselves from the ghetto to the Broadway stage. And the only way we can do that is through pride. So in that sense, pride is a virtue because it may promote your accomplishments. It's associated with motivating people to do better. So from that perspective, the traditional religious version of pride as a sin is wrong. To the faithful, the path of the sin of pride has always led to hell. It would seem that many people now ignore this sentiment. It's very easy to function on passages in Christian scriptures that tell us that God can and will forgive everything and to overlook or perhaps ignore those passages which reference hell. For centuries, mankind's soul has been seen as a prize in the eternal battle between holy heavenly angels and the demons that serve the devil. Now that picture seems a little yellow with age. Today, we emphasize less the angelic influence on our side and much more our free will. In the letter of John, the Bible defines sin as lawlessness. But in a society where the mainstream philosophy is, if it feels good, do it, and pride is positive, there's no room to consider pride a sin. Or maybe by celebrating pride, we've erased the idea of sin entirely. Gregory the Great believed, as have many subsequent Christian theologians, that each of the seven deadly sins can be reduced to pride. And if pride is no longer a sin, then this would seem to put the other sins in peril of becoming essentially irrelevant as well. The sin of pride may be more complex than we think. New research suggests there are two kinds of pride. One leads to success, the other leads to hell. The seven deadly sins have been Christianity's moral compass for centuries, a list of thoughts and actions that when practiced lead to hell. And pride has always been considered the most dangerous of the sins. Psychologist Jessica Tracy has discovered that the sin of pride has two faces. If we think about pride, I think most of us, most Americans, think about the good pride, right? Pride is something we seek out, and that we call authentic pride. This authentic pride is associated with positive feelings like productivity, confidence, and accomplishments. What we call the other kind of pride is hubristic pride. This is the pride that's more associated with the deadly sin idea, right? This is arrogance, egotism, conceitedness. One type of the sin of pride springs from righteousness. The other is a demon of deceit. And sometimes, we can't tell which is which. These dimensions are sort of considered chronic dispositions. So some people, over time, tend to experience authentic pride, other people, over time, again and again, tend to experience hubristic pride. And those are very different people. Without even thinking about it, we are naturally drawn to authentic pride, but are repulsed by hubristic people. Ricky Henderson, this baseball player, is a great example, where he, at one point, passed some record, and he said, I'm the greatest. And he was hammered for that, right? People really hated that. It's also within our nature to take pleasure in watching the sin of pride punished. There is pride that takes satisfaction in the crushing of rivals or of others. That's not virtuous pride. That's sinful pride. 
On the other hand, authentic pride builds prestige, and that's an essential ingredient for a thriving human society. If a person is good at something, he becomes proud of his skills and passes them along. And this is why celebrity endorsements and celebrity advertising actually works, because we have a prestige psychology to say, he's really good at that. Tiger Woods can sell Buicks for the same reason. Some of us surrender to the sin of pride. Others struggle against it, but we're all infected. It's a disease that lasts a lifetime, and perhaps even beyond, because the sin may be encoded in our DNA. At Yale University, Lori Santos uses primates to explore the evolutionary origins of human behavior. She's finding that capuchin monkeys exhibit behavior that looks a lot like human pride. Economists have studied the irrational tendency for people to overvalue something they own, simply because they own it. Scientists call it the endowment effect. Psychologists have hypothesized that one of the reasons for the endowment effect is because objects that you own take on some quality of yourself. You're sort of, in some sense, proud of that beat-up old couch that you have or proud of the home that you own. Because we value ourselves so highly, our self-worth, our pride, rubs off on the things we own. Santos wanted to see if capuchin monkeys also experience the endowment effect. All things being equal, would a monkey prefer the cereal he already owns over the apple he could easily get? Because the foods are equivalent, you might expect that you know, monkeys might want sort of half cereal and half apples, but it turns out that this is not what they pick. In fact, when the monkeys are made owners of cereal, they seem to treat cereal as extra value. In fact, you have to pay them a lot more an apple to get them to give up the cereal. The capuchins, like people, seem to take pride in the things they own. The endowment effect work that we've done with the capuchins raises the possibility that capuchins might have something like pride. While religion pins it on the devil, Science looks to evolution to explain pride's strange place in this world. If the monkeys are showing these kinds of behaviors, how can they be rational if they've been around for the last 35 million years? If the faithful are correct, the gates of hell may be overflowing. If you think having a sense of pride means an individual might go to hell, all our primate ancestors might be there, so it's probably pretty crowded and pretty loud. Whether or not the gates of hell were designed only for humans, it's difficult to see the sin of pride as a one-way ticket to hell. The nature of pride is more complicated than that. If pride simply indicates possession of something, possession of a resource, food, a territory, possession of a good set of genes that would make one a desirable mating partner, possession of a place in society, then clearly there's not only a benefit to pride, it's absolutely necessary. What is the sin of pride? It's a question that affects all seven of the deadly sins. Despite breakthroughs in science and sociology, evil itself remains a mystery. For that reason, the seven deadly sins are as relevant today as they were at the beginning of time. <laughs>